Hello, this is Camille Fairborn from Michigan State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's cause teaching and learning webinar. We're pleased to have as our presenters today, Philip, Philip Burkhart, Frank Kovacs, Ron Yurko, and Rebecca Nugent. Philip and Ron are PhD students, and Frank is an undergraduate student at Carnegie Mellon University, where Dr. Nugent is the Associate Department Head and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Statistics and Data Science. For today's webinar, they will give a presentation entitled, Aisle, a browser-based e-learning platform for teaching statistics and data analysis while learning how students approach it. The way the webinars work is that all listeners are muted during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into the questions box. We'll be sure to ask those questions towards the end and give the presenters a chance to respond. You can also use the chat box if you're having any technical questions. At this point, I'll turn things over to Dr. Nugent. Rebecca, go ahead. All right, well, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Um, thanks again also to the uh, Consortium for the Advancement of Undergraduate Statistics and Education for having us. We're very, very excited to show you uh, some of what we've been working on for the last couple of years, which is ILE, the Integrated Statistics Learning Environment. So before putting the slides into presentation mode, I do want to mention, if you can see at the bottom of the screen, the slides here, there is a website www.stat.cmu.edu slash aisle. And if you go to that website, you can see some of the videos we'll be showing. You can also see some data explorers that are active now that you're welcome to start exploring, analyzing, clicking while we're also talking about them or later as you prefer. So let's get started. All right. so. Briefly, let's, um, what, what's happening at Carnegie Mellon University? Well, Carnegie Mellon is a private university in Pittsburgh. Um, it's an R1 research university, but it has about 7,000 undergrads and 7,000 graduate students. Six undergraduate colleges. Uh, when students apply to Carnegie Mellon, they actually apply to a specific college. Admissions are different for the different colleges. Statistics is inside the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences which is a little bit of an unusual home for statistics and data science, but actually works out pretty well for us. The types of students, uh, the types of majors that we have in Detroit College are economics, English, history, information systems, and so on, and then also including statistics and data science. So when we teach students in Detroit, we really are teaching an incredibly wide variety of students in terms of their backgrounds, what they want to study, the types of careers they're going to have, um, much like you would find at any sort of um, liberal arts college or an intro statistics course that you would see at a large university. Our, our, all of our statistics courses are extremely diverse in our, in our student populations. We have around 520 primary and additional statistics majors. The most popular major that we have is statistics and machine learning. But Everybody at Carnegie Mellon, for some reason, takes statistics. So they do that from the freshman level all the way through the graduate level, the PhD courses as well. So we teach about a third of the campus every semester. Now, what's happening with us in Dietrich is that we're undergoing a general education curriculum revamp. This is a multiple year process. And one of the centerpieces of that general education revamp is this course, Reasoning with Data. So we are trying to modernize uh, intro statistics in a way um, that allows for more modern concepts to, to be involved. But also, we need to think about this intro statistics and data science course as part of the entire general education curriculum. So what I mean by that is, I have other things on these slides, writing minis, there's a new popular one called writing with data that we're working closely with. There are more um, self-reflection parts of this general education, experiential learning. Students will be building a portfolio of work that could include data analyses. And the Dietrich College, as well as the Department of Statistics and Data Science, is spending quite a bit of time thinking about focusing on the entire journey. So not just the final results of the student at the end of four years, but how they actually got there. And that is being reflected in our new course in IELTS. So when we, when we sat back to think about how we were going to update our intro statistics course, um, we did some interviewing and we did some asking around about the different groups that take these courses and many of them said similar things. Students had memorized steps that they were using with Minitab. They were relying too much on some um, preset 
set of things they needed to do without really thinking about the concepts. Um, we wanted to remove that student reliance. Also, counter to what most people are doing with their data science courses and putting computing on day one, we were actually trying to remove the computing cognitive load almost entirely. Our experience is that when you spend all of this time on computing syntax at the beginning, students spend so much time worrying about the syntax that they're not spending enough time thinking about the material. So we want to start people with thinking about data analysis and statistics and then layering in the computing as they move along in the sequences. This course also has student-driven analyses. They are choosing what to do. We are giving them open-ended case studies. We'll show you that a little bit later with the Data Explorer. And we're also including more modern concepts. So for example, a nonlinear smoother versus a linear regression or clustering or networks. These can be taught in an introductory way at a conceptual level when you have a platform that allows you to interact with them. Students also are doing written reports and presentations. These presentations can be oral presentations or poster, and the IELTS system facilitates all of these things. So there's thinking about what we do in the classroom, but there's also thinking about what on earth are these students doing? And I know for the educators that are listening, we have all spent time thinking, what on earth are these students doing? We see their results and their final product, but we don't see how they got there. We don't see all the different graphs they looked at or the different choices they made, or did they choose a box plot or a histogram, the number of bins that changed what they decided to do. So when we built this system and we thought about this course, we took it as a real opportunity to study the science of data science or behavioral data science. What is the impact of students' decisions on their data analysis? So when people make early decisions, it turns into a population of possible data analyses, and how can we study that? So IELTS, the Integrated Statistics Learning Environment, this is browser-based. You don't need to download anything. You can go straight to a, to a website. It's using modern web technology, such as JavaScript, et cetera. None of the programming is needed for those educators who are listening right now. Um, we can talk, we'll talk a little bit later, but you can, you can build lessons in IELTS without having to know any of these tools. The calculations are all local. You don't need to buy any servers. You can use it in class, out of class. It's adaptable. You're able to change questions on the fly during lab and class. You're also able to write notes. Um, this is automatically stored, so the IELTS kind of, it can function as a dot cam, but students can also take notes at the same time. So you have two sets of notes happening. All the actions are stored, which lends itself to reproducible data analyses. We track everything. Click the words you type. If you write notes, every cursive letter you do, if you're doing an audio um, voice capture, every spoken word. And during, um, during class or during lab, instructors can summarize and visualize what's happening with the students. So you can identify when people are maybe doing something wrong. You also can identify an interesting response for a discussion. There's also an editor for author, excuse me, for authoring IELTS lessons. This can be done in a drop-down menu fashion. We're also working on a um, package to do this in R. So instructors or educators who are used to doing things in R, you're able to build IELTS, or you will be able to build IELTS lessons then. So we use IELTS in several Carnegie Mellon classes, but today we're going to focus on the introductory course. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Philip. Thank you. And uh, what we are going to do now is basically just looking at some of the examples and showing you demonstrations of what you can do with IELTS as of now. Um, we have built a lot of like basic statistical widgets that you probably have maybe used, and we can make them available as well on the web page. We won't focus on them uh, this uh, today, though, but just be aware that we have like kind of simulation studies where you can demonstrate the central limit theorem or explain like what are conditional probabilities. We have things for confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, and for most of the common uh, continuous distributions, for example, we have like this distribution calculators that you can use. Here's an example, uh, just for little screenshots uh, of some of those uh, widgets. And then on the uh, lower left corner, you see that we have these different types of questions so people can in, uh, integrate multiple choice questions, free text questions, number questions, et cetera, and you can collect student data uh, through that. We also have an integration with R, so that for classes which might uh, use R and want to teach R, uh, that they can build uh, I lessons that explain R, and where people can actually evaluate their own code 
and see, for example, generate their R plots, etc. Now, what we will focus on today, though, is how we, I guess, differ, what we think about differently, and where we try to explore new things. And one of those is interactive labs. So I think um, that that has been kind of a bit neglected, at least in our field, and other fields have a bit tried more, like let's say physics. Um, but what we try to do is really that to bring these e-learning modules inside the classroom. Right? Traditionally, often we think about e-learning as something that you do online or that you do on your own, but we really want to bring this inside the classroom and enrich the classroom experience. And so by doing so, we, for example, allow instructors to monitor their labs in real time. And they can on the fly understand how the students are interacting with the class material and then for example adjust the pace or maybe review a certain item that some students have trouble with also the students answers in these labs are saved so they can be retrieved later for example when the students are preparing for their exams they can just look up the old labs and they will see their uh, responses there so for example, here we are going to now look um, at an example where we are going to contrast two views, uh, the instructor and the student view. So kind of in this blended learning context in, in an interactive lab, uh, you will see um, that obviously like the students have a different perspective than the, the teachers. So, and we, this is reflected in the aisle interface as well. So the instructor has a slightly different interface. So let's have a look at how this looks like. Um, we have here the student. That's the student view. And then let's say we have an instructor, that uh, woman there. The instructor has an instructor panel where they can, for example, load uh, notes before the class that kind of guide them through what they want to cover. If we switch back to this um, student here, we see the student is interacting with some data. So this is a simple example where we have data from a college students and they report uh, how much they drink and whether they would report cheating of their peers. So the student is interacting here. They put in their answers, they get immediate feedback, like whether their answers are correct or not. Now, the instructor sees something different. Here, for example, the instructor sees in these blue meters how many people have actually answered that question of the students that are currently uh, active. How many people are currently working on that question? And when they click on the button, the instructors, they can visualize all the responses of the students. So we have here this response visualizer, where you're on the left-hand side, you see all the individual answers, and on the right hand side we have this frequency table with the most commonly chosen responses so you can hopefully uh, find out okay what are the, the misconceptions what are the wrong answers that students are getting and um, we can look at the individual uh, responses here no worries this is all made up data so we just have some made up data here but in reality right you will see the actual student data so you can check what did they answer we can also delete let's say responses that were erroneously entered now we are back in the student view Students can have all these different types of questions. Here we have a multiple choice answer. We also have questions for when you have to match different elements of two lists or you have to bring things into a certain order. Back in the instructor panel, the instructor is also able to monitor in real time what the students are currently doing. So we have here this list of active users where we see this is a demo, so we prepared something with just three users. But you can see here already that we have this little horizontal bar chart where you see basically all the questions or all the uh, components on the side, and you see where students currently spend their time with. And so you can then move on, because we found this often really hard um, to gauge where everybody is at in the classroom. The actions, as uh, previously mentioned, are all saved to a database. And so you can actually export them just with the click of a button. You can export all the actions of these labs, either anonymized in the original form, both as JSON and, and CSV. For, for example, like downstream analysis. And you can also use it in the class just to see, okay, what are people entering, etc. Back to the student. We now look at, um, here yeah, the student's looking at uh, how many drinks the, the females drink. So the highest number of drinks is 20 in this case. So that's uh, what the question was about. They see that answer. Okay, the student is entering the answer here in that uh, question box. And they get feedback again. If they enter something wrong, though, right, then uh, they will get a different response there at the time. Now, we have these kind of questions where you have like pre made answer choices. We also have questions where students will answer with free text. For example, here we look at the students with the maximum number of drinks and we want to see what other characteristics are they similar with. 
And here, if we do this, right, we basically let all the students explore the data on their own, and they write their own text responses, and then we discuss them in the group. And what we found is that actually having these response visualizers and actually being able to bring the answers of the students to the uh, front has been really useful in the classroom. Initially, we thought, okay, it would be something that uh, later on an instructor can use to, for example, see, okay, what did people answer? Do they understand, et cetera? Instructors can also click on individual users here and they will just jump right to the elements that the students are currently interacting with. So you can basically track the progress of individual students as well. Now, if we go to this response visualizer here, for the, for the free text question, you see this words cloud here on the right. You can click on a word and then you, it will filter out all the texts so that you only see the text containing those words. You can bring up certain answers so that you can highlight those in a discussion, for example. And you can bring really students who might otherwise not want to share their answers, right? You can bring their, uh, their responses uh, to the forefront. And you kind of get a more complete sense of what the, what the answers were. You can just filter again. We can search for different answers, et cetera. You can also filter by, by date there at the top. So if you have different classes, for example, um, you can compare those as well. So that's kind of what we have in terms of like different views. We have a kind of a student view and like instructors have a different uh, point of view and are able to see much more and react in real time to the students' uh, problems, demands, et cetera. Okay, so traditionally, and uh, I guess in, in, in an intro statistics class, right, we are always thinking about kind of you know, tabular data and numeric variables and categorical data, but we rarely move beyond kind of this comfort zone and into the things that are more, now these days more and more uh, people are interested in, for example, like texts, networks, or images. And so uh, what we have built is also kind of these little widgets or data exploration tools to analyze such data. For example, here we have the State of the Union addresses by, by the US presidents, where students can look at the data, they can browse them, and then they can actually in, investigate some basic trends here using like very simple text analysis. Like here they're introduced to the concepts of stop words, what, uh, and they will look at kind of the word frequencies, some word clouds like bar charts of the most commonly used words, and what happens if they filter out different answers. We are also collecting feedback here. You see these buttons there? So students can, in real time during the class, uh, provide feedback. Students can save their plots for, for example, a homework question. Here we are now looking at uh, different words and their co-occurrence. Basically, we use this to teach like conditional probability. So like a purist might have maybe some offense, like just using a sample data kind of to teach, uh, to treat, uh, teach probability. But what we found is that this is really much more engaging than just kind of confining yourself to like coin flips and, and a deck of cards, because those are kind of the problems that our students in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences will be more interested in and will also down the road probably work in, in their jobs. So, and this kind of can hopefully generate a lot of fruitful discussions where you think about, okay, given uh, that uh, in a certain speed, this word occurs, do other uh, words occur and we can investigate there whether that changes over time. And you find actually some, some surprising patterns there. You can also here in this little widget look at the trends over time. So we can um, put in here a start and an end here, and then we can look at the top number of words um, over that time period. And again, we see here um, a word cloud and then a um, bar chart of the answers. So here we really hope that we can be um, make more vivid classroom discussions because you can do this in real time, right? You don't need any coding. There's not, you can go directly to the, to the things that are inter of interest to you and you can discuss these things on the fly in the classroom. And so that's kind of what we have been trying to do, really get rid of all the stumbling block blocks and all the things that can slow uh, instruction down. So moving on here, um, let's see. We're just trying to go to the next slide here. One second. No worries. All right, now there we go. Okay, so um, we also have certain real-time communication features. 
So they can be used, for example, as well in the classroom. We have in, um, integrated like real-time chats so that actually students can be paired up in the classroom and they can chat with each other. Uh, for example, if there are certain um, questions that uh, people can start kind of a debate about, they can ask questions and their peers can see uh, what those questions were. We are also currently investigating like a peer review functionality. So this is still in kind of its early days. But what we are trying to do is let students experience kind of a data analysis and then a, a project where they write reports and then other students uh, are going to review those reports. And all of that will as well be facilitated through IELTS. So, not only can the IELTS framework be used, though, inside these interactive labs, it can also be brought into the lecture hall. So, for example, an, uh, an instructor can take this IELTS sketchpad component here, and he, he or she can annotate slides with a drawing tablet, let's say. And after the conclusion, after the lecture is done, uh, they can upload those uh, notes with the click of a button and so easily disseminate them to the students. So, students appreciate this, this access to the lecture slides, obviously, and instructors can appreciate the easiness of, of not having to scan, let's say, uh, hand annotations and then upload them to a learning management system. Um, the notes that the instructors are, take, that are taking are also transmitted in real time to the other students in the class. So this really allows them to only add on to these notes kind of the, their own comments and what they are most interested in. On the other hand, like the instructors can also focus right students' attention here. It's much uh, more vivid and better than just having like these static slideshows like on a PowerPoint presentation. Um, finally, all the IELTS components that, uh, that we have shown so far and all the other ones that we are going to show can be embedded onto these slides as well. So you can easily have like, like similar to when you use like um, classroom response systems and stuff like that, where you can just show, you can do surveys in real time, show questions to the students to answer or show some of these simulations or other tools that we have been developing. So, as was the case with this kind of the speech analysis, the analysis widget, we have also kind of built uh, a tool to basically conduct whole data analyses uh, using the platform. So here we have a data set on, uh, NF from NFL passing data that was collected by Erwan Nyoko here. And um, students can go to this data explorer, they can look at the data, look at all the different variables. Um, for example, here we have the passing percentage, uh, the, the completion percentage of these passes, and uh, we have here the um, total expected points added from past attempts. And um, now again, without any coding, you can kind of do a complete exploratory data analysis, hypothesis testing, etc., all in this platform. Here we have someone creating a histogram for the completion percentage, and then we overlay, let's say, a normal density curve. And then we say, okay, that looks kind of normal. And then we can calculate some of the statistics uh, for these variables as well. Now, we also have um, ways of linking these plots. So for example, here we are with the data table. So here, for example, we are looking at a scatter plot of the completion percentage and the total EPA. Um, and now when we select individual points in these plots, right, this will uh, limit the data points that are displayed. So we can actually filter out these data points here. So for example, um, here on the, the people with the highest completion percentages, the four, four highest ones here, that's Tom Brady, Tony Romo, I guess. Manning and Warner, um, so we can see those here. Um, so that's kind of allows really people to dig into the data and and um, and, and look what's what's going on. Uh, they can do statistical tests. Here we are looking at a correlation test between the completion percentage and the total EPA. We suspect that it was greater than zero. So let's do this test at a significance level of one percent. And so here we get the test result this part as well. And again, this can be used inside the classroom and or at home. We have help text, and we can also bring these things to the front. So if you're using it in the, in the classroom, you can actually show it in a full screen display of the individual outputs so that uh, it is not kind of very small here and you cannot really read what's going on. Now, what we have kind of also invested a lot of time in uh, is to allow students to write their data analysis reports entirely in IELTS. So students can, without any programming experience, right, uh, they can just write their own reports then they can use markdown syntax to do so. So they can do all the formatting that will later on if they might use um, R markdown or they use uh, like the NITA package or something like that in R, they will uh, benefit from those skills as well. 
And, um, and then here though, without any programming, they can just drag and drop the outputs, um, uh, the outputs from the right. And, and it's kind of a gradual buy-in, right? They don't need to learn a lot of like all the markdown syntax. There are these buttons here that help them to automatically insert what they need for these reports. So we had students write, uh, like we had 200 students or something like that, write their data analysis reports all using this platform this semester two times. Now here, for example, we look at this completion percentage. Uh, now we can change the plots here as well, as well, right? We can change the titles, the labels, etc., And then we can just drag this plot inside the report here on the left-hand side. And there's a live preview where we can see how that plot looks like. And we can do this both for like tables as well. So you can drag in all these plots, but it's also like, for example, frequency or contingency tables and stuff like that. And those are easily editable as well in the, in, uh, using this kind of extended markdown syntax that we provide here. The finished reports can be exported in various formats. So we have students writing data analysis reports, but we also have um, integrated functionality to export these reports as academic posters. So you can have a poster session at the end of the semester, for example, where students team up maybe in groups and then they present like their finished poster at the end. The reports themselves can be exported in various file formats here. So you can export them either as an HTML page, for example, or as a PDF file. Um, all the other options are here just to save your work in progress um, as you move along. These reports can be submitted on the platform that we have been developing as well. So this can be used so that then later on an instructor can go to a dashboard and they see all these reports that have uh, been submitted by the students. And so we really hope to use that data that we are collecting behind the scenes because we not only get now data about what the students are writing, but we can also correlate it right with the uh, things that students have been doing. So we can go uh, investigate the whole data analysis pipeline. How do students go from the analysis steps that they are doing to the final and finished reports. What happens along the way? What do they uh, add on? What do they remove in, in the text? And so, uh, Juan Yoko has done some uh, like analysis looking into these questions. And we've so far, I think we have uh, found some interesting results on that end. Thanks, Philip. Next, we will provide examples of the type of analysis possible with IELTS data. For example, we are able to link together each student action with the text of the resulting answers to generate word clouds for each of the different visualizations students made when answering questions. This analysis follows standard text mining pre-processing procedures such as spell, set, spell check and stemming and uses the term frequency inverse document frequency values to denote which terms are unique to each visualization. Unsurprisingly, we see students use terms such as correlation and relationship when they made scatter plots, while for histograms, they use terms such as range and probable. Our primary focus with IELTS data thus far has been on clustering student answers using the text of their answers. This figure displays a tile plot where each row is an individual student, each column is a question, and the color denotes which cluster the answer was assigned to based on its text. We see general trends with com common colors displayed in each column, but this view allows us to quickly spot students that have answered questions differently. For example, the lone red tile in the second column is because the student simply wrote skip for time, an answer unlike any of the others. It is important to emphasize the rich quality of data IO records as students work on their analysis. Here we present on the left hand side bar charts with the cluster memberships of student answers to an open ended lab question where students were asked to describe a relationship between two variables age and weekday alcohol use. They were given no explicit instructions for what visualizations or tests to perform, resulting in variation of the actions performed by each student as seen in the timeline chart to the right of the bars. Each student action is represented as a circle colored by the action type, while the vertical black bars denote when they submitted an answer. We noticed from this figure that students that only made box plots had answers belonging to the blue cluster, with answers referring to the median. Although the question was about the relationship between two variables that are typically considered continuous, and many students responded by creating scatter plots, in this case, the two variables were limited in their possible values 
resulting in scatter plots with points overlaid on one another. This was a reason for potentially making a box plot and explains why these students had answers that were unique compared to the others. So in, in general, um, what we're trying to do with ISLE is, is uh, what we're trying to do with this webinar is, is give a sense of the types of statistical analyses that are available at the introductory level. So right now we have data explorers that are available um, for everyone to explore at this website, http, again, stat.cmu.edu slash ISLE. It's at the bottom of the slide as well. Um, and those data explorers are, are available for anyone if they want to try them in their class. Um, you don't have to have an account for those. You're welcome to just play around with them. Uh, we also have several videos on this website that if you want to get a better idea of what's happening, of what's happening in aisle. Um, so, and again, the problems that we're trying to solve, we have two things. One, we're trying to provide a better, richer, um, more data-centric experience for introductory students at all levels people coming in to study statistics and machine learning, people coming in to study creative writing. How can we facilitate interesting analyses for them? At the exact same time, we're trying to learn how they learn. How do people do data analysis? Some of these instructor um, interactive displays allow you to identify when students are cheating and when students are goofing around, but it also lets you see that sometimes people just write differently about data or approach problems in different ways and turn in different kinds of presentations and reports. And if we can get a better understanding of how different students think about data analysis, then we can adapt our instructor methods or we can build different materials for different groups. So um, if you have any questions, we'll take them now. Um, we also you know, actively encourage anyone to reach out to any of us. Um, we'll be at giving several talks on aisle over the next six months to year, and we're, we're happy to talk to anybody. We're happy to help facilitate anyone using aisle. So please do reach out. And again, thank you so much for having us. Well, thank you very much for presenting this. This is very interesting to me personally. Um, those of you who are attending, if you have some questions you want to ask the presenters, please go ahead and put them in the question box uh, right now. Our uh, first one is, who do I contact to get an IL account? Um, the person to contact for an IL account is going to be Philip. Okay. And his contact information is right there on the slide, PGB at andrew.cmu.edu and um, we can talk about what you might want the account for for example like so we could we could try to customize what it is that that each person is trying to explore or look at so um yeah you know, yeah please feel free to reach out yeah definitely and uh, some of the examples though that will be posted on the on the web page right they are all They're usable without open. any yeah. account so you can just go there and you can okay. just play around with that um, oh, oh go ahead well, I was just going to add that one thing that we did, you know, given the, sh the, the webinar um, framework, we didn't go into kind of what an action log looks like on a detailed level um, for each individual piece. We, we, showed, we showed some small examples, but if people are interested in, in thinking about how to have an entire class look at this and what does an action log look like for a class, we're, we're happy to have maybe a Skype call or a conversation or meet you at a conference or come to your school or whatever works, so yeah. Okay, um, Melissa says, this sounds really interesting. Does it sync with Canvas or other LMSs for grading? Not automatically, not yet. So, I mean, this is something that we might explore down the road. So far, it hasn't been necessary for us because um, we either do things directly through IELTS, we get these action logs, and we can also generate then real-time statistics. So, for example, you can just you will be able to look at uh, attendance sheet uh, for, for the labs directly through IELTS. So, um, but no, to answer the question in a short uh, sentence, we don't have currently uh, any integration with, let's say, Canvas. So, so, some of the grading that we're doing in IELTS right now, as Philip said, we do live in IELTS. So if they're, if they're interacting with the IELTS framework, we, we can be checking their answers and grading. And all of their actions are associated with the students' accounts. So we can assign grades. With respect to grading things like reports, um, the reports are submitted or presentations or what have you. 
those are submitted as a PDF or an HTML, and then those could be dropped into any kind of grade scope, any kind of canvas, any kind of, you know, that sort of um, online annotation system. You also could open them in aisle, for example, and you could annotate using that sketchpad feature in aisle, and then, you know, the students would could get some annotations back that way as well. Okay. Um, Amy wants to know, in its current form, can you load your own data into aisle to explore, or is it limited to the built-in data sets? Uh, yes, you can, and this is Frank talking. So we actually have the functionality where you can drop in a CSV file. Then you would select which variables are continuous, which variables are categorical, and then you can have a fully featured data explorer with the ability to, to create your own reports, to analyze all the data, and it does give you full control over what designation the variables are. Okay, that sounds awesome. Um, Don's asking, is there a text aligned with the aisle content? Content. Oh, text? by text, are you referring to textbook or documentation? Yeah. Textbook. Yeah. I, I think textbook. The, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're in the process of building documentation for the system. The aisle system itself, um, or what we've built, is does not align with any particular introductory stat textbook that's on the market. Um, but we do have the functionality that you would expect to see in pretty standard intro books, more in McCabe, et cetera. Um, so, you know, and then we also have additional things, the text, the images, you know, some of the network capability, that types of things. So it, it does, it does align nicely with the typical topics that you see, but it does not follow like a particular book. Okay. Um, Ashley wants to know what would be the cost of using aisle and does it depend on class size? So no, it actually does not. So that's the thing, right? Because we do all these computations locally on the students' machines, so you actually do not need to have like a large server infrastructure to support this. This scales very easily to like hundreds of students we have right now. And uh, right now you, uh, you can just use it and it will, it is open. So you can, we, are, we are happy to set you up, right? There's no, no, no costs involved in, in, in trying out and using R in your, in your class. Which is even more fabulous. That is great. <laughs> yeah, so I, think, I think what's going to happen um, over the next, um, I don't want to put a timeline on it because my team's looking at me right now going, what? But um, <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, we're, we're moving toward releasing sort of open things that we want everybody to be able to do. Um, and then if somebody is interested, of course, in something that is much more customized, right to their particular course, right? Or just, you know, just something that's very specific to what they're doing. Um, you know, we have research students working on it and, and, and postdocs and things like that. So so we could figure out if there needs to be some some kind of support arrangement reach for something that's very specific, right? But okay. but there will be, there are open source pieces that are gonna be available um, to anybody who'd like to use them. And then we can also study, for example, what different levels of students are doing all over the country anonymized, of course, but imagine the richness of student-driven analyses that we can do about how students are learning introductory statistics all over the, all over. So. That is very exciting. Well, I think that's all the questions that we've got. And again, thanks to all of you for showing this to us and for building it and for making it available. That's even the best part. <laughs> so, um, I also want to thank all of our attenders for attendees for attending today. Our next webinar will be on January 8th at this same time. So I encourage you to keep your eyes on Causeweb or your email for the registration link and for other webinars coming up during the new year. Again, thanks to everyone for being here and I hope you all have a great end to your semester and a lovely break between semesters. <laughs> have a great day. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.